Good morning, everybody. I invite you to come in and take a seat, and we'll start our morning worship service. It's a wonderful privilege to be with you all this morning, worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, it's wonderful to see everybody having uh, a sweet time of fellowship and getting along. And so um, if you're a visitor for the first time this morning and uh, you haven't been here before, a special welcome to you for all first-time visitors. There's a little packet of information about our church that we'd love for you to have. It is behind the center section of pews there in the back uh, on that little table back there behind the center section, and you can pick up that uh, information packet. It tells you about the Evangelical Free Church in America and what we're all about. There's also a purple visitor information sheet in there, and if you could fill that out and drop that in that blue offering box behind you, that would be great. And we'd like to know a little bit more about you, if you have any prayer needs or anything like that. Uh, if you'd like to know about church membership, you can fill out the same purple card and drop that in there. Let me open the service this morning by reading Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2. This is about the great glory of our Lord. It's a Psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Let us pray. O Lord our God, you are great in holiness and in majesty, and uh, you are resplendent in glory. And as for us, we are weak and miserable sinners. We are weak because we cannot do anything for ourselves, even our lives are not our own. We are miserable because we cause pain to ourselves and pain to others, and that is all due to our sin. And so we pray that you would forgive us for our manifold uh, trespasses and uh, our wicked deeds that we have committed this week. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and soul and, and our, our strength, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. And so it is with great gratitude, O oh Lord, that we accept the forgiveness that, that you have given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that it has made a way for us to meet with you now and to have fellowship with you and to worship you and to uh, uh, ascribe to the Lord glory. We don't know who these mighty ones are, but uh, we know that you are you're great in glory and power, and that is that much is clear to us. And so we pray that as we meet today that we would glorify you out of the gratitude of our hearts for uh, having reconciled us to yourself and given us a great promise of eternal life with you. And so we pray that you would be glorified this morning here today. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you wish to uh, contribute towards the various ministries of the church, there's a couple different ways that you can do that. You can drop your offering in that blue box behind you. Uh, you can give directly on the church website, gccpensacola.org, uh, or you can send uh, a check in the mail to our address here. One quick announcement for, uh, regarding the Friday morning ladies' Bible study. That Bible study will meet this Friday, April 19th. That will be the last Bible study of the spring. So that uh, Friday morning Bible study will meet uh, this week. An update on our need for volunteers. First of all, a big thank you for all of you who have volunteered to work in the nursery. We really appreciate that. Uh, we, we could use a few more uh, hands on the green team. That would be the folks who would keep the, the grounds uh, nice and tidy. And that is a commitment of once every four to six weeks, thereabouts. So you can see Jeremy or Jeremy, you can give us a wave here, or Melissa Grizzard, Melissa, give us a wave. And you can sign up with one of them if you want to help out with that. And now I'd like to uh, ask uh, India Gatewood to come up for a VBS announcement. It's great being vertically challenged. All right, good morning, everyone. All right. So, yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> okay, so VBS is very quickly approaching. I'm getting very excited. 
um, which I get excited about a lot of things, but I get super excited about Vacation Bible School. All right, so we still have a sign up in the foyer. So if you feel led to volunteer, we would be very, very, very appreciative and very excited to have you. Two, we, if you have signed up in the foyer already, or you're just curious about how our VBS may go, we will have a meeting next Sunday after the service. So please join us. I'm not really sure if we're gonna do it in the sanctuary or if we're gonna do it in the youth building. We will let you know next week and we'll remind you that we have a meeting next Sunday. But yes, any and all volunteers are more than welcome. So I am praying that the Lord puts it in your heart to volunteer. Um, Wendy and I are um, the head people, mostly Wendy. Um, however, VBS, we can't do it all, so we really do need volunteers. All right. So now I will ask Jason Grizzard to step up. I know y'all are probably expecting me to do something very India, but I'm being boring today. I'm not doing a VBS song. I'm sorry. <laughs> Which may be why you're clapping. Today I'm going to talk about Waterfront Rescue Mission. And I appreciate the church giving me the next 45 minutes to do so. <laughs> Just kidding. I do have a few slides that I would like to share with you. Uh, if you don't know, I think some of you do. I'm the vice president of ministry services at Waterfront Rescue Mission. This is my 17th year there. And we are just really, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be a part of this ministry. This has been a wonderful gospel-centric ministry. And part of our calling, of course, is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, And that certainly includes our homeless neighbor, and it certainly includes of those who struggle with addiction. And so I'll talk about both of those things today because they are uh, inextricably linked in many cases, but not always. And so uh, I'm going to talk about what Waterfront does and what we provide. So... You can see uh, Waterfront's goal has always been to offer hope and healing through the gospel. We, this year, we've been around since 1949, and this year we are celebrating our 75th year, of, and so we are very excited about that. You, of course, if you follow Pensacola News Journal, there's a lot of chatter always about what's going on in the homeless community. And I always remind people that Waterfront is the most quoted provider in the community and the least directly quoted provider in the community. And so we are referred to a lot. We are talked about a lot in good, bad, and ugly. But I will tell you, we've been here since 1949, working with the homeless and doing what Jesus has called us to do. And uh, we're very excited uh, to have this calling and so we actually serve the homeless on both of our sites, uh, both here in Pensacola and also in Mobile. And so we have two main campuses and we serve the homeless through our day center. Our day center is open Monday through Friday of during the day between of seven to four. And we provide services to the homeless men, women, and families who come up our walkway and that is through medical clinics. We have a clinic here in Pensacola. We have a health care provider that provides uh, primary care physician level services to the homeless there in Mobile as well. And so we have a number of providers that come on campus. We have showers, laundry, uh, phones, laptops that they can get on and look up a job application or look up information. We have providers that meet with them of, of course, the homeless, because they don't have a home, they don't have an address. And so we also provide 
of a place where they can receive their mail. Many of the homeless who come up our walkway actually receive disability or social security checks. And so uh, we also have a number of veterans who receive checks and so they can't get those unless they have a place for their mail to come. And so we do a lot of basic things, uh, also ID services. You have to have an ID in order to really get a lot of basic things done. And so a lot of things that you and I take for granted every single day are things that we provide, including three meals a day for those who stay with us. Of course, the day center provides a walk-up lunch to anyone who is hungry. And so we meet a lot of immediate emergency needs. Uh, we also, uh, at our day center, as I said, we serve all, we serve men, women, and homeless families. We, we have an overnight shelter for men. We work with other providers. Uh, to provide overnight shelter for women, but I will let you know a, a very a little talked about fact is that waterfront on a, a regular basis when we have inclement weather, and some of you guys may have been familiar with that from a few days ago, uh, during that night we actually, uh, we actually ended up housing some women uh, on that night because when somebody comes up and it's severe weather, we essentially suspend our normal operating procedures and we will do everything we can to keep people safe on nights like that. And so we've had uh, a lot of things, uh, crazy things happen on those nights, but we will do anything we can uh, to keep people safe. I will also point out to you, you can see uh, some of the uh, services that we provide at the shelter. We provide a basic overnight shelter. When someone first comes to us, uh, we give them three nights free. And then whenever they move into an extended stay program or an extended stay situation, which is usually two to four weeks, and that is an opportunity to kind of launch them into one of our programs. Uh, we have 45 to 90 day programs that they can be a part of. Those are veterans, working work training programs, working homeless programs, chronically homeless programs. And those, uh, as long as they're doing uh, the guidelines of the program, they can move forward. Now you heard me say, wait, you mean that those first three nights are free and then we have a couple of weeks and then we have programs. Our goal is to move a person forward off the street and out of homelessness into permanent housing. So there are individuals who come up our walkway every day, it's hard to imagine, that are not interested in any of our programs. And so those who are not interested in moving forward in any of our programs, we actually charge them a $10 copay. It costs us about $60 per person per night for someone to stay with us, and so we offer that to them at $10 and uh, many of the homeless do have a means of currency, and uh, people are sometimes shocked when we tell them that, but we don't hide behind it, we don't apologize for it, because, and there is also many homeless who come and say, hey, I don't have any income, I don't have any way to do this. If they, uh, they can enter a program, or they can also work in lieu of the $10 several days uh, to get it. So there's a lot of different things there, but the key word that we believe that the gospel and the scriptures teach are expectations. We believe that expectations are at the heart of the gospel, and so that's what we stand to. We also uh, have a recovery program, which is a three-phase recovery program that is nine months. And so in that recovery program, you can see one of our guys there, George, who you may have seen working at the thrift store. Uh, he's doing a great job. He's fully employed and out of doing well right now and of out on his own, living in his own place. And so in that recovery program, we have uh, counseling, very intensive one-on-one -on -one counseling. We do a lot of gospel center classes and also addiction-oriented classes. We also drug test the guys, and we also have a smoke-free campus. So uh, we don't just say, hey, you got to stop smoking. We work with an organization that gives them the patches, the lozenges, the coaching, the training uh, to get them free of nicotine as well. We've learned statistically over the years that the guys who get off of nicotine are actually more sustainable in their recovery long term and so we made that decision several years ago to partner with an organization to do that and so those are just a few of the things that we do how can you get involved at waterfront let's go to the next slide please well actually before we get to that let's talk about a few of the stats that you may uh, see up here you can see 
that we have 3,368 individuals that we serve. Those are non-duplicated individuals that we served at the end of last year. If you're seeing more homeless people in the community these days, it's because Waterfront is seeing a 19% increase across the board of our day center and our overnight shelter. So already this year, our numbers are astronomically above what they were last year. Uh, they just continue to go up. Uh, you can see the number of veterans served, 432. That's about 13% of everyone that we serve that come up our walkway are veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces. And so we, they have served their country, and we believe that it's our time to serve them and to take care of them. So we have a veterans care program uh, where we provide them services and an opportunity to connect with the VA and to move into permanent housing and get the medical care that they need. You can also see those numbers of nights of shelter uh, of 62,000, almost 63,000 of nights of shelter, 168,000 roughly meals served. And then this is the, uh, a key stat for us as a Christ-centered ministry. We saw last year 76 people who gave their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. And that's really, thank you, that's really why we're in the business. That's what gets us up every morning is that there are, uh, you know, providers who give out food and give out clothing and doing those things. Nothing wrong with that. We work with a number of them. But if that's all that it was, was just meeting immediate needs and putting Band-Aids on issues and not really te preaching the gospel, I think I'd probably do something else. And so that number there represents transformation. And every quarter we have a graduation that honestly celebrates that transformation and celebrates the uh, change that can take place. Now, what we did last year, and the, the, we're going to talk about some ways that you can get involved. Uh, we started an opportunity to volunteer. So uh, hold that thought for just a second. You can volunteer at the mission. You can also volunteer at the thrift store. You can host an item drive. We've had a number of people or organizations that have done that. You can obviously shop in our thrift stores. Uh, Waterfront Rescue Mission uh, does not receive any government funds. Our money comes from those who shop, give, donate in our thrift stores or who write checks and individually or collectively give to our organization. About 60% of our revenue comes from the thrift store and the other 40% from donors. And so we are uh, excited about that, but we also rely on the community. We rely on you guys to go into our thrift stores. I appreciate those of you who have yard sales, the Depuries, and they also look and contact us and say, hey, can will Waterfront come and pick up this furniture or pick up these goods? We will. We will do that. So you give us a call, and we're usually about two weeks out on scheduling that and uh, we rely on you. Follow us on social media. Now, as far as Grace Community Church, how can you get involved? Obviously, you can give, you can do all of these things, but these are some photos that we have taken over the last year of certain individuals of, that we have been involved with, and I don't know if you can tell I had a hairnet on. I'm glad you can't, but no, you don't need to go back. <laughs> But you can see that these are all people who have served, and there's others. But once a quarter, we go to Waterfront. And let me tell you, it's been a real joy to, to serve with you guys. And so we're going to do this again on May the 4th. And so if you are interested in participating with us and of getting your hairnet picture taken, uh, this will be a grand opportunity for you if you don't want to get a hairnet hairnet picture taken, I can't even talk, then you can bring your favorite Atlanta Brave or Georgia Bulldog hat, and you can wear that as well. So, uh, but th this will be an opportunity. We, uh, we serve a meal. We provide a meal. We serve a meal to the homeless. And let me tell you, there's nothing. I can stand up here and I can talk about what we do at Waterfront, but until you go and you look in the eyes of people who are just really tired and broken and need to really be shown the love of Christ, 
uh, it really is a game changer. And so I encourage you. Uh, and so we're going to provide a meal, serve a meal, and then we're also going, we provide a chapel. And so you don't have to be involved in all of those things, but you're welcome to be involved in any or every part of it that you want. There is a sign-up sheet that's out in the foyer. And so again, that is May the 4th, that is in the evening. The, uh, the meal service time is at 5.30, so we ask people to normally come of around 4 o'clock. It, it's plenty of time to get us together. And I want to thank Jeremy Orr. Jeremy, you saw him uh, with that stern look trying to get us. Uh, there was a photo of him smiling, actually, but I thought this was more appropriate uh, <laughs> because Jeremy's been really our quarterback for this when we get there, and I've just kind of let him uh, take it on, and it's been wonderful to see him uh, coordinate everything. But uh, please come out if you're able to do that or if you're interested in helping with worship. The guys really, really enjoy uh, great worship because you may find it hard to believe, but they don't get a whole lot of great worship. Uh, because We have a number of ch churches that come from the area, and uh, I have nothing against traditional hymns. I love traditional hymns, and they're great. But uh, every chapel service every night, <laughs> it's, it's nice to have some, some new uh, blood in there doing some uh, praise and worship. And so if any of you guys are interested in that, just get with me, and we'll be happy to, to sign you up. So thank you. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. He picked me up, he turned me around, and placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you healed my heart. 
You changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master. I thank the savior. I thank God. I cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So long to my old friend. Burden and bitterness, you can't just keep it moving. Now you ain't welcome here. From now till I walk streets of gold, I'll sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. You picked me up, you turned me around, and placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you healed my heart. You changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior. I thank God. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. You picked me up. You turned me around. Placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master. I thank the savior. Because you heal my heart. Change my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master. I thank the savior. I thank God. fall face down on the floor all to echo all the ears of the Lord my heart can't help but sing with all of heaven roar forever echo all the ears of the Lord oh Fall, face 
face down on the floor all to echo holy is the lord my heart can't help but sing with all of heaven roar forever echo holy is the lord oh Before the throne of grace, majesty before my eyes, could it take my breath away? A million angels fall, face down on the floor, all to echo holy is the Lord. My heart can't help but sing with all of heaven roar forever echo holy is the Lord. can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. I'll walk upon the salvation. to be set in your promise and store now to stand. What can I say? What can I do? But offer this heart, oh God,
can I see?
Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that uh, you, the creator, God of the universe, um, have come down to be with us, Lord God. And we invite you here. We invite your spirit to move amongst us, Lord God. We are grateful that you know each person here by name. Uh, you know what's going on in each of our lives, Lord God, and you want to be involved in our lives, Father. And we thank you that we can worship you, that we can study your word, uh, that you can show us uh, how to live in a way that pleases you and honors you uh, and leads to a long and, and joyful life, Lord. And, and we just uh, pray again that you uh, would be here, you would guide my words, that I would speak your truth and nothing else, and uh, that it would be honoring to you. And we just love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can all be seated. Oh, Children's Church, yes. Yes. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jeff. I am not the pastor of this church. So uh, if you're here new, uh, come back next week so uh, you can see him. And he's much better at this than I am. Um, but I am going to speak on the peace of God. So uh, I kind of chose a subject because... Over the last number of months, uh, I have not had the peace of God, and and um, you know I've been a believer for a long time, walked with God a long time, done hard done hard things with God. Thought maybe perhaps I come to a place where I would have a better better sense of peace than I do or have had, and and then I felt that God God showed me this verse Isaiah twenty six three and four, which I'll be read, read a little bit. Um, that I thought really spoke to me about uh, uh, how better to pursue the peace of God. And also because, because um, I also, you know, I was a, a Christian school administrator for many years, and I, you know, and I read a lot, kept up a lot about what is going on in our society and, and the struggle really for our young people with, with their peace or their lack of peace and the, the anxiety issues that, that occur in our high school kids uh, college kids on, on up, and and, uh, and why is that? There's it's definitely a lack of peace in, in, in our population as a whole, um, and and we can be a great, we should be a great witness to the people around us in that regards. You know that uh, um, this quote I read here is: "There's one quality or characteristic that we as Christians should possess, and that is the peace of God in our hearts and lives." And Matthew five sixteen says, "In the same way." Let your, sh your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, so, so if we walk in peace or in, in a group of people who are not uh, experiencing peace, we are a great witness to God. And that, that really um, struck home to me or last weekend, because I know some of you were here last Saturday where we uh, att or attended uh, John Tenbrook's funeral. And, and we mourn with uh, Biddy and Ann and their family. But one of the people that were there asked a question, which was, why, why are people so happy here? And, and what an opening for a believer and, and for somebody who doesn't know Jesus to ask that question. Why are you, as a group of believers, not more, I mean, we mourn John's loss, and, and uh, the family mourns John's loss, but there, but there is not, there is not a, a overwhelming sense of mourning. There is a sense of peace, a sense of joy, and the knowledge that John is with his, his Lord and the Savior now. And, and uh, so we, as, as God's people, should, should be a spreader of that joy, that message. Um, you know, also, as I was preparing this, this uh, uh, topic, talking about this topic, I kind of realized... <laughs> <laughs> that's really the entire story of the Bible, you know, the, the uh, pursuing the peace of God. You know, there's the, the Bible, the way it talks about it is, is it begins with Adam and Eve in the garden in peace with God, walking with God in perfect peace. And then they sin, the peace is destroyed, and the rest of the Bible is all about God pursuing us to restore our lost peace, to restore us back to the condition that we uh, lost in the garden, um, which means... That's like, and that's probably why I've had so much trouble 
condensing these things. There's so many things. The Bible just speaks about peace in so many weird areas. So, so we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about, I'm going to first talk about peace from the world's perspective, how the world pursues it, um, peace from a biblical, spe- biblical perspective, and the two aspects of that, which are really the, the peace with God and the peace of God, and what's the difference between how believers and non-believers think and pursue peace. Um, so again, starting first with the world's view of peace. The de- you know, looked like, of course, went to, went to Google, looked up peace, and, and here's some of the definitions. A stress-free, stress-free state of security and calmness that comes when there's no fighting of, or war. Everything and everybody is coexisting in perfect harmony and freedom. Freedom from disturbances, tranquility, harmonious relations, the absence of fear, mental stress, or anxiety. It's really, you know, to summarize that, it's, it's a feeling of calmness and tranquility because all of your personal relationships with your parents, your siblings, your spouses, et cetera, um, are conflict-free and totally harmonious, and your circumstances are idyllic. You know, your great perfect job, perfect health, no money issues. So that's, that, that is what gives you this sense of uh, this feeling of calmness and tranquility. So how, so how does the world pursue peace? You know, one of the things, you, know, the, 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 you know, change your circumstances, that's kind of the idea. You know, go move to a cabin in the woods. You know, fewer people to have problems with. Change, yes. Yeah, so I love, love that idea. Let's go for it. Um, you, know, ch- you know, change your relationships. Get a new job. Those are all part of the idea of changing your circumstances. But that isn't really what the Bible talks about. You know? I mean, obviously, there are some biblical reasons why you want to change, make a change in your circumstances. But the Bible, James 1 says, consider it all joy, my brother, when you, when you encounter various trials. So we are not to run from our trials and just change everything because we're going through trials. The world also, also medicate, you know, medicate your feelings away. You know, I mean, there are, there are time and places uh, for a proper uh, medication when you have a mental health issue. But, but you know, I think it's kind of gone really big in our society now, and that's we want to find a quick fix for the mental health issues, that, that st- stress, the anxiety that we feel. Uh, alcoholism, perfect example of a way we medicate our feelings away. Distract yourself, you know, and try not to think about what's going on in the world. Video games, pick out a new hobby, take up running, you know, my previous passion there, you know, work out, physical fitness, that kind of stuff. Um, go to therapy, you know, go counseling. That, that uh, I mean, obviously there is, a, there is a time and place for therapy and counseling, but I think I always think about, about the, you know, the movie star who says, I've been in counseling for the last seven years or therapy, and I think perhaps <laughs> they haven't, <laughs> they, they haven't found the true peace of God. So, so I also found this little article in, in the Oprah Daily. I didn't know, didn't know there was an Oprah Daily, but there is. Um, <laughs> So, so the one of the quotes was that, is that when you can't escape your chaotic circumstances, you can still tap into the deep reservoir of peacefulness and serenity inside us. So there, there's a worldview that, that somehow peace lies within us and that if we just do the right things, we can tap into that. So, so what are the procedures for that? Meditate, you know, breathe in and breathe out. Feel the truth that you are safe and loved. Visualize your happy place. Read the story that you're telling yourself. Acknowledge your suffering. Connect to all common humanity. You are not alone. Talk kindly to yourself. Make a list of what gives you joy. Think about these things. Cultivate gratitude. Serve others. I mean, they have, they have hit on some, you know, the, and we'll talk about it in detail, but, but the mind. The mind is the source of our peace or lack of peace. And they, they approach it by... You know, think or meditate on make-believe stories. You know, feel the truth that you're safe in love. Well, maybe you're not safe in love by the people around you. Visualize your happy place. You can't be there, but you can visualize it. Connect to all humanity. Talk kindly to yourself. Think about the things that give you joy. I mean, those are, those are again, they're, they're, they're playing mind tricks, you know, to try to fool yourself into think, they're not thinking about the reality of life. So Tim, Kel- Tim Keller says... Worldly people believe that their problems come from outside of themselves, as in their circumstances, and that solution to their, their problems comes from inside themselves. Christians believe that their problems come from inside ourselves, as in sin, um, and that the solution comes from outside themselves, as in God. So for the worldly, worldly person, God never enters the picture. Um, so they miss, they miss out on the fact that you are, we have a creator God, 
who made us, who knows us better, uh, you know, knows us inside and out, knows us better than any person on the face of the earth, um, and he's the best source for peace. Um, the world never addresses that, the, you know, that, that uh, <laughs> saying you hear, that the God-shaped hole in our heart that only he can fill, doesn't address the broken relationship between us and our creator that needs to be restored or, or our sin problem. So it's just a few, a few statistics uh, about peace in the United States. Um, a CDC, CDC, Centers for Disease Control report, says that from 2011 to 2021, the percentage of high school students frequently, pers frequently students, high students feeling persistently sad or hopeless increased from 28% to 42%. So 42% of our, and it's only increased since 2021. It wasn't purely a COVID thing. So 42% of our high school students feel persistently sad or hopeless, um, but not at Aletheia, right, Harvey? Not, not at <laughs> um, a Harvard study in October of 2023 says that 36% of young adults, which is 18 to 25, report being anxious. 29% report being depressed. So this is you know, about a third of, I mean, 18 to 25. I mean, 18 to 25 is a pretty good time to be alive. You know, that's a... That should be a real positive part. You're young, you're healthy, you have a lot, the whole world to look forward to. So, so, um, so the world is doing a bad job um, at giving peace of mind to us humans. So we'll look at the biblical view at that. So I'm going to read um, Isaiah 26, 3 through 4, the verse that I felt like God had, had shown me. You keep, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. So if I was to paraphrase that and, and uh, say in a way that flows more easily, is that God uh, will keep um, us, you, will keep in, in, oh, excuse me. God will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in him, all those whose thoughts are fixed on him. You need to trust in the Lord forever because he is mighty and strong and never changes. So we'll look now at the, at the first part of that verse, which is you keep him in perfect peace. So you, you refers to God. It is God that gives us peace and keeps us in perfect peace. It does not come from within ourselves. It doesn't come from tapping the deep reservoir of peacefulness and serenity inside of yourselves. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let, your not, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So Jesus is the one that gives us peace, and his peace is way different from that of the world's. Another indication comes from the, from in the, the fruits of the Spirit, found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So as we walk with Jesus, the Holy Spirit will work in our lives to give us the peace of God. So let's go look at the word keep. So it's, again, it says, it says you, you, God, keeps him, us, in perfect peace. Um, so so the, the word keep in Hebrew means to guard from danger, to watch over, to preserve, to be kept close. So the whole... The idea here is that it implies that we need keeping, okay? That, that just like a young child needs to be kept from running into a busy street, we, we need to be kept from the fact that our, our mind naturally um, and constantly wanders away from God and his peace. And that we try to solve things on our own, we try to pursue our own, pursue our own desires. So God is our keeper. We are unable to maintain our peace without his constant help. So moving on to, to, so again, it says, you, God, keeps him, us, in perfect peace. So, so the, the Hebrew words translated as perfect peace is actually shalom, shalom. So it repeats the word shalom twice. So that's part of the, he, the Hebrew uh, methodology of, of, of uh, communicating intensity through repetition. So, so it doesn't, there's no word for perfect followed by the word for peace. It's just shalom, shalom. So what is shalom? Um, it means peace and health. It's the, it's the peace that comes from completeness or wholeness. So Tim Mackey from the Bible Project puts it this way. 
The core idea is that life is complex. It is full of moving parts, relationships, and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Count, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So Jesus, you know, back, even back, at, back in the Old Testament times, Jesus was a Prince of Shalom. That's what, that's what the God was sending. When he rules the world, um, Shalom will increase to no end. So, so true, pe true peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness. Our lives, our relationships, our world, not just our emotions, not just have this feeling inside ourselves. It's not just about our own personal peace of mind. It's about joining with God in, in the restoration project that he's running in the world at, at large. Um, I mean, in, you know, in many ways, you know, we are trying to restore the peace that was originally found in the Garden of Eden. That is, that I probably, I don't know, that's the example of what shalom would really look like. Um, so as followers of peace, as followers of Jesus, we are called to be peacemakers. We are, we are called to be part of, of God's work in restoring what is broken and, and, uh, and back to wholeness. So Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. So in the, in the New Testament, the, the Greek word for peace is, and I don't know how to pronounce this, something like irene, this E-I-R-E-N-E. -E. And the definition of that word for peace is, this, is the tranquil state of a soul assured of his salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God and content with his earthly lot, no matter what it is. So, the, so the, that definition, the, in the, the New Testament definition, really includes two different aspects of peace. It's, it's, the, it's the, the peace with God. This is the peace that comes from being assured of your salvation and now knowing you have nothing to fear from God in eternity. And then there's the peace of God. That's, a, that's the state of tranquility or quietness of spirit that transcends circumstances. It's being content with our earthly lot, no matter what happens to us. And that's the, that's the you know, my, most of us here are believers, but uh, um, that is the peace that we seek. Uh, so, so in order to experience the peace of God, we need first, first need to have the peace with God. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how do you, how do you get peace with God? Um, so in, our, in our natural state, we are at war with God. We are his enemies rebelling against his rule. We have overthrown uh, his kingdom and made ourselves the king of our lives, replacing God. Romans 8, 7 says, For the sinful nature is always hostile to God and never did obey God's word laws, and it never will. So we are, we are as in our natural state, we are re rebellious. We, are, we do not want to let God rule our lives. So the only way a just and, and holy God can react to a, to a rebellious people is to punish us for our sins. And there's nothing we can do um, in our sinful state to reconcile ourselves with God. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. So it's, so it's important to know that we, we cannot earn our salvation. There's nothing you can do um, by being good that earns your salvation with God. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so God took the initiative in pursuing peace with us by sending his son Jesus to earth. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift, the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So having peace with God is only possible um, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 19 through 20 says, For in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So peace with God means that our great our sin debt has been paid by Jesus, and God now sees us as righteous. So Jesus made peace between fallen human beings and God when he died on the cross. 
He restored, he offers the restoration really of the wholeness of the broken relationship between us and God. And this is summarized in Ephesians, verse, Ephesians 2 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. So it states again that, that our salvation comes, it's a, it's a gift that's given to us by the grace of God to people who do not uh, deserve it, who have not earned it, because you can't earn it. Um, but it comes by, by God's grace when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So what does p- having peace with God produce? It means our consciences are, our consciences are cleared. The weight of our guilt has been removed from us and placed on Jesus. It allows a Christian to live without fear of death or, or eternity. Our hope is secure in knowing that, that Jesus has done all that is necessary to make us right with God. And, and, uh, and, and it has restored the intimate relationship. And, and doing this restores the intimate relationship that we once enjoyed with God and gives us the joy of our salvation. So if there's anybody in here who has not experienced this peace with God and you want to talk about it, you can come see me at the end of, end of the service here. So once we have peace with God, we can experience the peace of God in our daily lives. So what's the peace of God? Can I come back to my definition again? It is, a, it is a state of tranquility or quietness of spirit that transcends circumstances. Being content with our earthly lot no matter what life brings our way. I, I do find it very ironic that um, uh, I have been mostly not at peace in the last couple of days because I've been preparing to speak about the peace of God. <laughs> so, for those of us who, who just love speaking in front of people, um, and, 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 and so I've had, I had the opportunity to practice what I preach as I was preparing what I preach and try to like, <laughs> okay. Okay, God, you, you make, you, it's, it's your call that I'm up here. You give me the subject. You need to like give me peace. I don't like panic and whatever. <laughs> Say, so, okay, so how do we experience the peace of God? By keeping our minds stayed on, him, on God and trusting him. So let's, so let's talk about trusting God. And actually, I'll be like, I, in my, engineering mind, you know, it's like, well, what comes first, the trust in God or the keeping your mind? But really, it's, they're all kind of tangled together. You know, they're, you don't get one without the other. Um, so we'll talk about trusting God first. So, so what is trust? It's to have confidence in someone, that they are who they say they are they, uh, and will do what they say they will do. That's something that makes you secure, makes you safe. So our, our Christian walk really begins with an act of trust. You, you have put your trust in Jesus, that you, you have agreed in your mind that he is God's son, that he died on the cross for our, to pay for our sins. Um, so, so we have trusted, we have already operated in trust, just coming to faith in Jesus. Um, so, so by definition, if you're a Christian, you've already um, have a certain level of trust in God. Um, but it, that part's easy. The harder part is, um, I shouldn't say it's easy, but... You know, as you follow Jesus and try to obey his commands, um, your trust level is going to grow because Jesus is going to ask you to do things that you haven't done before. He's going to ask you to do things that are uncomfortable. He's going to ask you to do things that the world thinks is really bad and are unwise. Your friends think are going to be unwise. And you're going to have to decide whether or not you trust in what Jesus says or not. So that can, can you trust in him that if you do what he says, that Things will be okay, even though you are going up against the world system and against um, whatever friends, family members. Um, so our trust level and our peace grow as we fix our eyes and mind on Jesus, and we obey His commands, and we become more more like Him. So now, looking at the, looking at the um, you know how staying or fixing our mind on God produces perfect peace. So what does it mean to stay your mind on something? Not exactly a word we use a lot. So it means to lay, to lean or lay upon, to rest upon, to support, to uphold, to sustain. So what do you lean your mind against when you're not doing anything? Uh, where does you, and that's a great, that's a great example. Of, uh, that's a great, that's not a great example. That's a great way to think about what is going on in your, your heart and mind. Is what do you think about when you're not doing anything? Where does your mind go when you're stressed, anxious, troubled? What do you look to for relief, hope, help? A quote from, from David Guzik. Right? The mind stayed on God is the place of 
peace and the source of our peace. To be kept in perfect peace is a matter of our mind. This isn't so much a matter of our spirit or our soul or of our heart. It is a matter of our mind. We are to love the Lord our God with all our mind, Matthew 22, 37. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind, Romans 12, 2. We can have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. We are not to set our mind on earthly things, Philippians 3, 19, but set our mind on things above. To have perfect peace, your mind cannot occasionally come to and lean upon the Lord. It has to be stayed upon him. If our mind is stayed on ourselves or our problems or the problem people in our lives or anything else, we can't have this perfect peace. In the spiritual attacks against us, Satan leaves, Satan loves to, to get our minds set on anything except the Lord. So that the mind's, the mind's role in our peace is, is huge. It's really the, the key. Um, I mean, kind of how I think about it. You know, circumstances occur in our lives. We think about these circumstances, the events. We decide if they are good or bad, and then our emotions kind of kick in to react to whether or not we decide this is good and this is bad. Um, so the key, the key now is just to stop um, and think about, about why, I, why your mind has decided this is good and this is bad. This makes me think of Errol. Where's Errol back? I say, because all, Errol's always talking about, you know, how do you know this is good? How do you know this is bad? Well, because, because you go to the word, you know, but, but we, you know, what we define as good is, is has these circumstances that we are encountering meet our desires, our wants. We want this, 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 this is bad because it's not giving me what I want. Where, where, where God is saying, I'm giving you this because I want to refine you and change you and change your desires so that you're trying to fi- follow my desires and not your desires. Um, so, so, so really, really the, the staying your mind on God is one of the ways that God works in, in helping you identify your misplaced do- desires or your disordered loves, is another way to look at that. You love this more than you love God. You want this love met more than you want uh, the love of God. So I'm going to kind of wrap up here by just giving you a number of things that, you know, so what are some things that you can fix your minds on? Number one, this is, and this is, I think this is, this is my go-to thing, is, is to remember that God forever demonstrated his unconditional love for us by sending his son Jesus to die for us. And, and therefore, that God's, God, has, God has your best interests at heart no matter what comes into your life. That, that if, he lo- if, he, if he loves us, you know, if he, those of us who have kids, you know, we love our kids, that we, we have their best interests at heart even though they may not think that we that they do, and and uh, the same way, um, and I and I think Romans excuse me Isaiah fifty three, uh, three through six is a great way to think about this. You know, he Jesus was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and he was we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All like sheep, all like sheep, all like sheep have gone astray. We all have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So that's just that's a, a great description of what Jesus did for us. His demonstration of his love for us. And that was written hundreds of years before Jesus even set foot on the earth. In the words of Paul, Romans 5, 6 through 8, for while we were still weak, or at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Number two, meditate on the gospel. You know, we always, you know it's like you think, you know, you, you hear the gospel once, you accept Jesus as your savior, you move on. Well, that's the way. You, you're not going to have peace if you operate that way. You need you need to you need to think through, um, and I'm not going to get into it because we don't have time. But just to, to think through what God did to save you, what the gospel says. Um, yeah, and, and God has given us the the, the uh, Holy Spirit to help us do that. Um, think think of the many gifts that God has given us. Uh, here's a Tim a Tim Keller quote. You are becoming spiritually mature 
when we get to see that the real issue is not why bad things happen to us, but why so many good things happen to us sinners. Until this happens, you don't have peace with God. You haven't fully grasped the gospel. So, so I mean, we, we think we're pretty good people. You know, we deserve a good life. You know, we, uh, you know, especially if we have turned life to Jesus, you know, that we things should go well for us. And, and, and well, actually, you know, we're all sinners. We, we, we deserve um, God's punishment. Um, but he gives us all these good things. Um, and, and Keller's gospel summary, I always like, love this, says we are, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe, yet at the same time we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Th- this should give us gratitude. So we should pursue a spirit of gratitude, understanding what God did for us. In the, um, okay, I'm going to skip some of these because it's time is going so, so develop an eternal perspective. Th- this is not our home. You know, if you go through life thinking this is your home, this is the best you're ever going to have, it's going to be, you need to, you know, live to the max now, um, then, then you will not have peace. You know, that you have to realize, and that's a hard thing to do. You know, <laughs> it's a hard thing to do. The older you get, the easier it is, because <laughs> I guess it's getting closer. Um, <laughs> And, and, it, and actually, you know, it actually, uh, in other ways, because, you know, you're, you're I, can't, I, I, my, I can't run anymore. I, used to, I ran for 45 years, loved to run. Can't run anymore because my knee's messed up. So it's like, you, know, you realize that, that hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to heaven. I'm going to have a heavenly body, and I'm going to be able to run again. And I'll be able to beat my wife at running again. That'll be, <laughs> I'll, feel, I'll feel good about myself, myself again. And So, so anyway, to develop an eternal perspective. Think through what God's desires are and how you can align your desires with his. So and the only way to do that is by, is by, is by spending time in the word. What, what, is God, what is God doing? What does he want done? And then, and, and, then, and then when something happens to your life and you're unhappy, think about, well, what's my desire in this situation versus what is God's desire in this? So work at aligning your desires, your love with God. Look, look at creation. Now, I think you know, Brett's always good about this. You know, he's big, big into all those pictures from the web. You know, but but the, but to the, the think about that God, the God of the created the universe, He is so powerful, um, but yet He knows each of us individually, and and to, to 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 look at creation and to understand that this is not, you know, this is not an act of evolution, or I, I prefer to use the word accidentalism. You know, that somehow. We've had an accident after accident after accident after accident that produced all of you, and not to mention the universe and all the, and and I personally find that hard to believe that that happened. My my when I became a believer when I first became a believer I was a submarine officer and working in the shipyard and, and I thought you know this is kind of like evolution is kind of like thinking well, I can take all the pieces of the submarine that are in the shipyard and I can put them in this giant cement mixer. And I could just spin it for a billion years, and poof, out comes a, a functioning submarine. I don't believe that. So I don't believe that. I don't believe evolution slash my accidentalism really occurs. The final one: um, bring your needs to God in prayer. Philippians four six through seven. Uh, and, and Brett mentioned this recently as, well, as a verse he didn't like, because <laughs> like me, you know, you think like, oh, I, sh- I should not be anxious, but. Anyway, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, <clears throat> let your requests be, made, be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the battle for peace um, in our life begins in our minds, and it rests in our minds. It's not just a, it's not a feeling. Your, your mind is the generator of your feelings of a loss of peace. That, that is, a, you know, and... and and Christian peace does not mean you do not feel things. It doesn't mean you mourn for the loss of your loved ones or the disappointments and the things that occur in your life. You, you do, you, but it's not, you still have that inner sense of peace that God uh, has your life in his hands and that he's going to use you for good things. So let, let me just, just uh, um, close. I'm just going to pray and then I'm going to do the benediction. So Father, we thank you, like God, that you... Um, first off, has, have given us the ability to be at peace with you through your son, Jesus. And if there's anybody here that doesn't know that peace, I pray, Lord God, that, that you would speak to them and they would come to give their life to you, Father. 
Um, but, it, but as we walk out of here, Lord God, and into the world and deal with our daily lives, Lord God, and the circumstances that, that uh, we encounter, that we will seek to f- fix our mind on you, to stay our mind on you, to grow our trust in you by obeying your word uh, and doing what you want us to do, becoming more like Jesus and being a light for him in this world. We pray this in, in Jesus' name, amen. So benediction I'll read is, is uh, Numbers 6, 24 through 26, and the thing I read said, so this is God's original benediction, the first benediction in his word. It said, the, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his fi- face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So go and walk in peace and be a light to the world.